cloud. Awesome. Okay, so you all should have gotten that record notice. And before we dump, jump in, um, I just want to share our guiding principles and community guidelines today. I invite you all to listen deeply. I invite you all to embrace discomfort and notice tension. And when you do notice discomfort or tension, if you do, explore those feelings. Um, same thing with curiosity. Why is it coming up? Why might I be feeling this? And don't forget to take care of yourself along the way. Take risks, ask questions, and be vulnerable. We're all here to learn. Um, these systems of injustice weren't built in a day, and so don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is a space for learning. Um, and then hold each other with compassion. One of the things I always like to say is social justice work is a practice, and practice means that we're not going to be perfect. And so with that, we need to work daily and get feedback from our community members in order to be that much better in the future. And so with that, I'm gonna go into brief introductions, but I'm also going to launch a poll while I'm introducing our two amazing speakers. Um, so we're just gonna get a context of who's in the room as I'm doing these introductions. And so today I'm so excited to introduce the amazing Sherry and Suda. Um, first off, they both, have experience in city governments, government overall, they're organizers, they're facilitators, they're strategists, they're movement builders. And so I really can't say enough that both of these amazing folks are really entirely a whole package and have so much to learn from. Um, specifically, I just want to call out a few notable things. Um, Suda has been a co-founder for the City of Seattle's Equity and Environmental Justice Initiative, um, and Sherry actually launched the first youth participatory budgeting project here in Boston, Massachusetts, which is my hometown. So I'm really excited to bring them both online today to talk about the intersection of collective giving and democracy, because we know that there's a huge intersection. Y'all are going to learn tons today. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass our two amazing speakers the mic. And I will spotlight you both right now. OK, so there's one. Awesome. All right, y'all, take it away. Hey, Kelsey, thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and um, the whole Philanthropy Together team for pulling this together. Really excited for this conversation. Um, Sherry and I had a chance to have a tiny bit of a conversation beforehand and we were already just getting super jazzed. So we're gonna get into it. Um, and, and just to kick us off, uh, we thought it would be fun to kind of ask each other introductory questions, but we wanna invite all of you um, to also share your answers in the chat so that we can pick up a little bit on what you all are thinking about as you enter this conversation. Um, so I'll kick it off. Uh, Sherry, if you want to start us with this question that I think is the one that we are all really entering the conversation with. You know, what does what does democracy mean for you? Um, and what are the words and the adju adjectives and the experiences you think of when you hear that word? And folks, if you want to drop in, what comes to mind for you in the chat? Um, that would be lovely. But let's let's start there. Well, Sada, I'm so excited to be in this conversation with you. I'm excited that you asked this question. I'm excited that our conversation is going to be participatory, which is really thrilling. And so I hope folks are excited to, to use the chat um, throughout to let us know what you're thinking about. And as I answer this first question, again, what is what does democracy mean to me? I'm excited to see what, what you all think it, it means to you. And I've been thinking about this a little bit coming into this conversation, but I also did a little bit of a project last week on, on democracy with a group of folks. And we kind of asked a series of folks what democracy meant to them. And I wrote down a couple of things that I brought with me today. And so here are a couple of, of words that, that stood out to me about what, what democracy means. My first word is participation. Democracy means an opportunity for us to engage in a thing together, specifically decisions to decide together. Another big word that stood out was actually consent in democracy. When you when you look at the definition of democracy, or if you've been in Philly, or if you are in Philly right now, 
as you move through public spaces, which you could debate, maybe Philadelphia is one of our like modern birthplaces of democracy, you'll notice that there's a lot of language around consent, right? Who participates in decisions and how people consent to decisions being made. The other thing that I think about in democracy is actually fairness or equity, agency, not just the ability to participate, but actually access to be able to participate fully. And then the last thing that I'll just, that I'll add, and not to add on like, or end on a bad note, but also to acknowledge something, especially in the United States, that there are things that I want democracy to me. And then there are also parts of my, my lived experience, my family's lived experience, the lived experience of my ancestors, where I have to recognize that democracy sometimes has meant a thing that's really painful. It's actually meant um, not a lot of opportunities to participate. It has meant privilege for some and actually limited access for for many. And so as I talk about what democracy means to me, there's also this hope of what I want the future of democracy to mean for us all. There is this element to me that maybe is really obvious, but democracy kind of means participatory democracy, chance for all people to participate in decisions together that affect their lives. And my hope is that that democracy actually means participatory democracy. So I don't have to maybe add that word in on the front end. As I was talking, I'm keeping my eye on the chat. Just a reminder to invite folks to maybe share the words, adjectives, things that describe what democracy means to you. And, and so to, now I'm gonna turn to you and ask you this the same question. And maybe I'll add something a little bit on the end. And that is, what does democracy mean to you and how does it connect to collective giving? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I loved all of the pieces you were, you were raising that idea of, you know, what does democracy mean? What do we wish it would mean? Um, I've, I would consider the climate justice and immigrant rights movements are sort of my two movement homes. Um, and when I think about, what I wish democracy would mean, and I think about particularly the immigrant rights movement in the United States, it, it does, there's a big gap between what I would, I would hope for what that word means and what it actually means. Um, but I think for me, one of the kind of key things that um, I wanted to lift up as I was hearing you speak um, is this idea of power and that democracy is about sharing power. In, and I think I saw someone in the chat say radical inclusivity, but I think the radical piece for me is that we put power on the table. We're not just talking about going to the polls and each of us voting, but democracy is an act and, and in my view, sort of a continual act of sharing power. And, and when you ask that question about how does that intersect with collective giving, um, you know, I think that's a big, Democracy, I think we often think about it as voting or it's about sort of the political place of engagement. Um, in my view, as we see what's happening around the world, the rising authoritarianism and fascism, democracy also has to be about our everyday lives. And so when I think about collective giving, this is where, you know, so much of the giving industry and philanthropy has become about, well, I'll just I'll just like buy a piece of social justice, or I will make myself feel better today by making a gift, and then I go back to my daily life. Collective giving invites us into sharing power with each other, into democratizing our own economic privilege, into um, you know really taking individual practices and making them collective experiences. And I think democracy can't be an individual experience. Democracy has to be a collective experience. And so those are some of the things, you know, as an initial framing are coming up for me as I think about collective giving and its intersection with democracy. But I know we're gonna get into this even further. So I wanna just take a second here and also ask um, folks to share in the chat, 
Um, I'm seeing some things popping up, but really want to hear sort of how are you all thinking about collective giving and this intersection um, as each of you are practice practitioners of both democracy and collective giving. So to continue giving us a little bit of context and framing for this conversation, Sherry, um, and without me going further down uh, a, a conversation that I could probably have an entire hour long discussion about. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about participatory budgeting? You know, I've had a tiny bit of experience here in Seattle um, getting to infuse some of the environmental justice values into our city's participatory budgeting process, and it was really exciting. Um, and I'd love to hear more. I know it's evolved a huge amount since that little tiny tidbit I saw in Seattle, and um, I'm curious to just hear how you're all thinking about participatory budgeting. What are some of the examples and highlights of that work? Totally, and it's so interesting as you were talking about collective giving, one of the things I was thinking about was the fact that it is a it is a practice, right? And when we talk about participatory democracy, they're actually, the one way to think about what participatory democracy is, is a set of democratic practices that allow communities to make decisions together. And under the umbrella of participatory democracy, there's all sorts of practices. One practice is participatory budgeting, where community members make direct decisions about how public funds are spent in their community. And let me just back up a little bit, because I think this was said as part of the intro, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Again, my name is Sherry Davis. I'm the co-executive director at the Participatory Budgeting Project. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her. And what I'm gonna do is share my screen, hopefully for just a second, really quickly. And someone is just gonna give me like a thumbs up that, yeah, Kelsey, you're incredible at this work because I've prepared no one for this. So now we're just getting wild in the Zoom. And what you have in front of you is just a, a, a graphic, an image that comes from a toolkit that we have that explains how organizations use or could use participatory budgeting. And as I explain or answer your questions that on what participatory budgeting is, I thought it would just be helpful for you all to see a little bit of a map on some of the phases of, of what PB, and I'm going to start saying PB, what, what PB is. Participatory budgeting, as I just mentioned, is, is a process where community members make decisions together about how public funds, usually about how public funds are spent. And so you might think of government as an organization, right? Government is business. And so participatory budgeting as a tool doesn't just have to take place in government agencies. It can also take place in organizations. And so as I describe how PB works, you could imagine it working in a city or place to the tune of like $27 million, where Actually, right now, and so there is a $27 million um, participatory budgeting process where community members make direct decisions about how public funds are spent. You could also think about this as a tool for organizations to engage in transparent ways to talk about how they're making decisions and prioritizing the work that maybe they'll do together with the limited resources that they have. Anyways, y'all. Here's how it works. So usually PB starts with a design phase. So it's not like a prescriptive process where we say, here's all of the things and there's only one way to run participatory budgeting. Instead, we say, there are many ways to do this and you all are experts of your community, place or organization. Let's write a rule book or guidebook together that explains how people will engage in this process so that everyone knows the roles that they will play and has some general expectations of how we're going to make this collective decision together about a budget that impacts all of us. And then we move from the design phase to one of honestly my favorite parts of participatory budgeting, the brainstorming ideas phase. And earlier folks said, Maybe radical inclusivity, or I mentioned radical imagination as part of democracy. When we brainstorm ideas, here is the space, time, and place to collect hundreds, if not thousands of ideas and be really iterative on what is possible with the resources that we have. 
Then we move from the idea gathering space into the developing proposal space. This is where we move maybe from what are all of the possible ideas to what are the most feasible ideas? What are the ideas that are going to have the greatest impact on equity? And what are the ideas that maybe are going to meet the goals that we've set out at the beginning of the process or indicated in, in the rule book or guidebook at the very beginning? The best part of proposal development is when people go through it, they learn things. They learn things about others in their community. They learn things about the agency or organization and maybe what the opportunities are to collaborate in some places and maybe what the limitations of an agency budget or an organization's jurisdiction includes. The best thing about proposal development is that no project makes it onto the final ballot in a participatory budgeting process unless it's fully vetted. And that happens in the proposal development part. People that participate in this part say that they have the biggest skill gains, that they're more likely now to maybe put together a proposal of their own because they've had this experience of engaging in proposal development in a PB process. Once the ballot is finalized, eligible community members are able to vote and in a PV process out in a community, we're really able to reduce barriers to engagement, right? So folks that maybe are for formerly or currently incarcerated are eligible to vote in a citywide PV vote. Maybe individuals that have varying citizenship status are able to vote in a PV process. Usually folks as young as 12 or 16 years old can vote in a PB process. In the city of Oakland, there was no minimum age. So anyone of any age that could engage with the materials could vote in the PB process. So really removing barriers to that point earlier, democracy doesn't just happen every four years. Here is a way that we're able to engage folks in ongoing decisions that affect their lives. Last but not least, the winning projects are funded and then the process is evaluated and we're able then to kind of like begin again. I mentioned that this is maybe a different way of behaving, certainly a different way of doing business. And so that is the long and short of what participatory budgeting as a, as a process is. And as I was mentioning that, I, I hope that folks were thinking about like, hmm, there's some interesting ways in which we might be able to use this both out in like the government or public sphere, but maybe also within our, our own organizations. And maybe there's a, a resource that will drop at some point that will kind of point people to like, ooh, if I do want to use this sort of framework within my organization, how, how might I do that? So that's my long answer, sort of what participatory budgeting is. Um, what did you think of that? That was great. Thank you. Thank um, you. I was thinking about a few things as you were talking that just were standing out to me. This piece about that collaborative proposal development. You know, when um, I when I was seeing this process here in Seattle, in Seattle, uh, one of the things that was really interesting at the time it was focused actually on just having youth participate in it, and so you know, we had all these young people who otherwise like hadn't really gotten to engage with their local government feeling like, wow, they actually get to make decisions together. And some of the interesting negotiations I saw during some of our community meetings um, amongst young people who were getting introduced to city budgeting processes, I would say probably most of them had never looked at numbers, you know, been, a been able to influence such significant budget amounts before. Um, unless they had done something with their school district, potentially. So it was, I think, in that piece about radical inclusivity that we heard earlier in the conversation, um, to me, that that sort of negotiation, and it's not just about, like, let's each go and do, take a vote, right? It's really about how are we coming together around common goals, common vision, alignment, even if not in 100% agreement, right? We Alignment is so key. Um, and recognizing that actually this everyone's ideas have value to be on the table and we have to figure out together which ones we're going to move forward. Um, so those are some of the things that really stood out to me as you were talking about that. And I always appreciate a nice visual. So thank you um, for, for putting that up there. Oh, I'm happy to to kind of bring to bring the visuals and then and, and then I'll also just kind of like point out 
that one of the the things about that you're that you're making me think about about participatory budgeting but i think broadly when we talk not only about democracy but how we work together to to make decisions is, is actually this point on and fairness and equity. And unless we build that into the methodology or the process, specifically the practice, the front end, it, it really won't be a, a central part of people's experience. And so when we talk about like participatory budgeting, what, what we often encounter is that folks are experiencing government really different. If folks are using participatory budgeting at their organization, they're experiencing likely their organization really different, like a different level of maybe transparency um, because that is what's required and expected in a process like this. Just to give you like a super, super fast example, one of the places that we're seeing participatory budgeting and right now is actually in Phoenix, Arizona, where a school district, a high school district d decided that they were going to repurpose part of their budget. And I give you this example because people often ask me, ah, is participatory budgeting a thing that happens when you have extra money? And mm -hmm. I think this is a really good question. And the answer is no. Participatory budgeting is a thing that happens when we have finite and important resources available for us to make really important decisions that impact everyone. And so in the instance of Phoenix, Arizona, there was a $1.2 million budget that was used to employ school safety officers, SROs, which are armed officers that are within schools. And after a ton of research, became really clear that these armed officers weren't making students feel safe. And maybe there were some real alternatives to having armed officers in schools that, that are actually data proven ways to not only grow safety, but keep grow the feeling of safety, but keep students in school safe. And so they repurpose this budget to go through a participatory budgeting process so that students, parents, and teachers could think about racial equity and safety and how they can use their lived experience to manage this really large budget to meet their needs. And so the end result is you have a different sort of, of conversation. You're able to tap into community expertise and you're able to get a really different maybe outcome than seeing some of what was funded previously funded again. And so I think that's true for both government folks and for folks that work in organizations. But that brings me to this point. And when we did this work in Phoenix, as we're doing this work in Seattle, as we do this work across the country, I'm describing something that's really different than most people's experience with local government or most people's experience with decision making. And so making decisions together is hard. I think I encounter a lot of folks that say, I love the idea collective giving. I love the idea of participatory budgeting, but but what's the smallest amount of this you need in order to call it collective giving? What's like the, the lightest lift version of this that we need to do to be able to call this participatory budgeting? And I often find that folks have this real challenge around imagining their institution as, as doing this like deep and collective process. And I wonder, Siddha, if you've ever experienced that or how you talk to or how you respond to organizations or institutions that say making decisions together is is hard and, and how do we manage that? Yeah. Um, gosh, that's such a like really live question right now, I think across philanthropy um, and, you know, just I currently run a um, I am CEO of a global network that has 35 affiliates around the globe of S uh, social venture partners. And I'd say each of them answer this question in different ways. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I have seen in my experience that enables this to be um, a successful and, you know, when you say kind of what are the enabling conditions for people to make those kinds of decisions together. I think a lot of it has to do with being really power aware um, when people come together. Um, I think, you know, some of the best giving circles 
are ones that are built on a lot of trust. Um, and it's not just about trust between the people who are giving the money, right? And kind of pooling money into the collective giving, giving circle, but it's also the trust with the people who are receiving the money. And, um, and I think about that a lot. Like it's not these, one of the things I love to say, I sit on two boards um, and I, I love to say to my fellow board members, you know, trust is built in the work. And what I love about participatory budgeting and collective giving is they give people sort of playgrounds for building trust. That it's not about let's go over here and do like a rock climbing event together and we'll build trust, although that can be fun. Um, and then come back here into the room and we're going to make decisions together. No, it's actually in the making decisions together, in the conflict that arises in those moments, in the conversations that happen, in people being able to say, like, here's the, here's the lens I'm bringing to this. Here's my racialized and socialized experience that I'm bringing to this. Here are the values that I lead with. And navigating those conversations with other people, um, I think, is how we are able to build really successful collective giving and, and sort of these more participatory processes. But I think your point about the sort of intent and time and commitment it takes is really well taken, right? I think um, one of the risks I've seen in organizations, and I think I saw a lot of this happening kind of in the 2020, um, racial justice reckoning and changes that were happening across philanthropy was sort of a rush to every decision should be made by consensus. Every decision should be about everyone being at the table. And one, I do think it's it's really worth us saying, like, if you're going to do that at scale, it takes a lot of money. Um, it does take effort and planning and really great facilitation for people to be able to participate. Consensus does not mean equity. Consensus does not mean democracy. And I think we get those words confused sometimes in these kind of processes. So my, my advocacy is for us to get into more collective action with each other and to be practicing democracy on small scale because then it makes it easier to scale it up, right? If I have lots of experiences naming my own power, bringing my power to the table, I'm going to do that better over time. But if I am consistently told by people in authority and by people in power, your power doesn't matter, your voice doesn't matter, then when even if I'm put at a table where I get to make a big decision on city government budget or a, a foundation's budget, I may not feel like I get to say what I need to say, right? Um, so, to me, a lot of the enabling conditions are practice, practice, practice. Do it on the small scale so you can do it on a larger scale. Um, that's why I love collective giving because I think it gives us a sort of uh, low risk practice ground, if you will. Um, and it, just a way that you can say like, I'm already going to be giving money. Why not do it in a way that allows me to share power, connect with other people, build some relationships and trust. And and all of those things, I think, are really um, conditions that also help us just be better members of democracy together in general. So those are some of the things that are coming to mind as, as I hear you ask that question. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that sort of decision making piece. I know there's a very specific framework related to participatory budgeting, but just thinking of you as the person you are and all the myriad of ex experiences you've had, I'm curious kind of your broader framing um, on how we come together to make those kind of decisions and really enable democracy in our daily lives. I think you have a really good point about, about practice. And a lot of the work that we do at the Participatory Budgeting Project is really about transforming democracy to really center community power. and. I'm just going back to some of the our, our initial conversations around power, choice, consent, these being some words that are actually quite core to what democracy is. And I think the experience of democracy that most people feel right now doesn't actually create a ton of space to practice decision making together. Most people's experience of democracy is that some other people 
make decisions that we live with. And there are moments that we can lobby or strategically participate in conversations that result in some policy change. So I think what part of the challenge here when we talk about what, what is hard is that the system that we work in right now has 400 years of practice of doing things like a very specific way. And that practice certainly bleeds over into how we manage our organizations and the spaces that we make decisions together as employees, as employers, as members of community. And to start to build maybe new tracks for this train that democracy is on to like really move along, that can feel intimidating. It can feel like um, really different, right? And I think that some parts of different are like really uncomfortable, specifically for leaders, right? Leaders that are maybe engaging in a participatory democratic process really have to do some practice of their own to prepare, to hold, and to your point, facilitate process of deep engagement. And so I think that some of the enabling conditions to allow for a successful community-led decision-making process, but not, not only practice, but actually support training, onboarding. I think that folks, when they engage in something like collective giving, when they engage in something like participatory budgeting for the first time, there is a steep learning curve. And so how do we create space for folks to maybe learn something a little bit new, maybe experience something a little bit uncomfortable, maybe actually make some of those decisions that they would look back on and say, oh, yeah, that was a mistake, um, that they can then take forward into their practice next time. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that I often tell people. I don't think participatory democracy is hard. I actually think it's quite different. And it might take a little bit of a different prioritization of time than some other methods. I think that one of the benefits though, is that you're often making the right decision together and asking the right questions along the way. And until more and more people experience what it's like to do that together, we're always gonna default to that 400 year old way of, of doing things. And so I think that's a little bit of, of the challenge is that um, yes, there's this like opportunity to practice um, that feels really good. Maybe we don't practice enough, but where are those safe spaces to even learn about methodology like participatory budgeting and then try it on? I feel like finding those those try it on spaces make taking up the mantle of community led decision making much easier than maybe starting without any support or starting without um the experience or guidance or two cents of someone that maybe has done it done it before. I think starting from scratch is also the thing that that maybe makes this a little bit harder. Because while mistakes are going to happen, you certainly don't want to make mistakes that maybe could have been avoided with some information like best practices. So with that said, Sita, I, I know that we've as we started this conversation, we talked a little bit about what democracy means. We talked a little bit about the intersections to that in collective giving. We've talked a little bit about what participatory budgeting is and maybe how it's related to this idea of community-led decision-making. We've talked a little bit about what some of the challenges are along the way, but I don't think we've actually talked a ton about what this sort of opportunity kind of offers us. I, I tend to like maybe skip over some of the impacts just because I'm, I, I do, maybe this happens to you, I do this all the time. So I see what what the outcomes are um, constantly. And I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the why, like what are the benefits of, of maybe answering that question of, or managing some of the challenges of a process like this? Why why do it? What What have you seen? folks, organizations, um, philanthropists get out of going through a, a collective giving process? Yeah, that's a, um, a wonderful question. And it's a good reminder. You're right. I think it's easy to, to always to skip the why, um, just given, especially since I spend so much of my time 
in in the day to day thinking about collective giving and how important it is. Um, I like you know one of the stories I have around this is um, some years ago uh, a few women of color and I we were sort of scratching our heads about the fact that we had a whole set of really amazing women of color leaders who are running for office. Um, and there wasn't really a clear way that we could figure out getting them funding without just like all of us trying to go to every single one's fundraiser. And something about that just didn't sit right with us. We, we all three are community builders. We're all three people who really wanted to make sure that we were sort of um, I think the term we used was like having a warm hug for these leaders of color who are running for office in a really challenging time. And so we said, you know what, let's just put out an email to our list. Um, we'll invite people to a little kind of little house party and uh, we'll have all these candidates there and people can just essentially pool their money and whatever we raise will split evenly amongst the candidates. So that's the call that went out to folks. Um, and we got an overwhelming response. I have never in my time in Seattle up until that point been in a room in one person's house. So we like overpacked the house we because we had so many people show up. Um, we had the best food because one of one of the folks made a bunch of food for us, which you know, anytime you get you get a whole bunch of women of color together, there's gonna be really great food on the table. Um, and, you know, so we walk into this room, I think there were maybe like 70, maybe 80 women of color in the room, all talking together, people who didn't know each other from all parts of Seattle. You know, some folks were in the tech industry, some folks work in community, some folks work in government, education, healthcare, like the whole range of sectors were in that room. And I was reflecting um, with the other organizers and with the candidates who ran for office on like how unusual that is to have all of those folks in a room together from all those different sectors, again, with that sense of shared purpose. And so the, the kind of community that we built out of that one opportunity of collective giving was incredible. Um, but I think the, the other piece of it was that the candidates who we raised money for shared with us that this felt so different than their experience of fundraising, um, because this really felt like community coming in to embrace them and community mm -hmm. holding them collectively. Um, they weren't, they didn't feel like they were running by themselves anymore. They were like looking around this room, getting teary eyed, knowing that they had all these people who had their back. And it wasn't just about the labor organization or the environmental organization who had endorsed them. It was really people who had their back. And so that to me is like, I know that's not an outcome that fits really well on a grant report to a funder. But that is such a critical outcome, I think, right now for the kind of community building that we need to be doing. When I look at what's happening to democracy around the globe, to me, it's about that. It's like, how are we reinvigorating the kind of community and connectivity um, and like that social inclusion that allows people to get outside of their economic class, to get outside of their... Um, socialized identities and to come together and to to say you know this is about us it's not someone else's job to fix problems it's not someone else's job to make sure that democracy succeeds it's our job to do that um, and so that intersection for me with collective giving is it gives us that chance to do that for all sorts of issues not just on elections um, so I think for in terms of you know the why for me is really about the civic engagement piece. It's about community building. Um, it's rececognizing that, you know, we're we are we've just come out of a period of incredible social isolation. You know, we have a Surgeon General who speaks about the epidemic of, of isolation that's occurring in the United States and around the globe. And that has real health impacts for people. And so I look at things like collective giving and on a very um, high level kind of scale. I see it as a really core thing for justice and moving justice. But on an individual level, it actually has health benefits, you know, that we need to be connecting with each other again. Um, it has community benefits. It has, um, it 
opens up ways for us to be with each other um, that I think lots of people are craving right now. And frankly, in many cases, community is demanding of people who have the economic ability to move money. So that's a, that's a little start on my why. Um, and, and I'm curious also to hear from you on that piece as well. Yeah, uh, and, and people are offering thoughts and questions in the chat, keep doing that. We're gonna touch on the thoughts and questions that, that you all bring forward. We, we have um, so much more time left too. So, so really, if there's a thing that you're wondering, uh, we're totally happy to, to, to speak to that. Um, I love some of what you described here about the why, right? It's the, the why is we're in this moment right now where we've experienced uprisings um, in the last couple of years around the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others that have put a fine point on racial justice or racial injustice and how I think decisions impact us all that relate to to policy and and specifically budgets, how we spend our our finite time and and resources and and I do think that being able to say, well, honestly, racial justice is a big part of the why I think is important. The other thing that that I hear people say is, um especially in government or, or sometimes in institutions, maybe a lot in institutions, is we do it this way because that's the, the way we've done it and we don't know any other way. Yep. And and I think part of the why is, is being able to explore and speak to models and practices that that are not not only are they alternatives, but they're they're better alternatives because they address the pain points that community members have clearly communicated, that community members have protested around, that community members have demanded a response to. And so when we move to models that address those pain points that include transparency, shifting power, well, here is, is an honest answer for folks that work in government to build a new practice or add a tool to their toolbox, so to speak, that allows us to address and move past the, the pain points that have like come up. And so I think some of the why for me is not only the moment that, that we're in, but some of what I've heard folks name that work in local government. And y'all, I'm a, a recovering government employee. I, I worked in local government for just about 15 years. And so you might be sitting with how old is Sherry? That's a conversation for another day. I have a very good skincare routine. But what I will say is that folks that work, work in local government who have the um, responsibility often of doing deep community engagement do not often have a lot of support to actually figure out the robust methodology to like manage a deep engagement process. Often true of very brilliant people that work in institutions or organizations when an agency um, determines that they now wanna do a deep engagement process that engages folks in a radical way that allows everyone to make a decision together. There isn't often a budget to go through the learning that is required to skill up the staff members to then execute a, a process as people maybe imagine. And so along the way, there, there can be a lot of those challenges. But the why to do this is so that you are on the, the, the cutting edge of the future of work, right? The why to do that is so that you are on the, the cutting edge of the future of government engagement. I think that we've recognized that these, the ways in which we we work together are gonna to continue to change. If we've learned anything from, from the pandemic and the, the movement energy and progress that we've seen in that space, we've learned that like, not only is change possible, but we're also experiencing it. And we're gonna to continue to have this conversation around the right roles for our team members, the right roles for community members in this quote experiment 
of democracy. And I think that here is, is an opportunity for us not only to get ahead of that, but also to literally practice it so that we are prepared um, for, for when we win. And I think the by when we win, I say what I really mean is like we're having a conversation about democracy, the future of democracy, what we want it to look like. And I think the biggest part of why for me is that we actually have to prepare to win the thing we want. We actually have to prepare to win an equitable and transformed democracy. And if we win an equitable and transformed democracy through our experiences, the way that we show up at work, the way that we engage in local government, well, we're gonna have a conundrum, right? We're not gonna know how to act. We're not, we're not gonna know how to function in this new fabric that we're creating together. And so a biggest piece, like the why, is, is actually to be prepared for the future that we want to build, for the future that we want to live into together. It requires not only our imagination, but our practice right now. It's the same thing I tell young people that are getting involved in community organizing or this long arc of democracy work. It, my manifestation for them is not that people continue to think about them as future leaders, but that they see them as leaders right now so that they can begin to practice and experience that. And so that we as a, as a, as a people, as a society can experience their, their brilliance. I think the same thing is true for our practices around democracy. We have to bring that new cutting edge energy to the forefront so that we're ready for, for what happens next. We're asking people to dream. We're asking folks to um, put forth their wildest dreams and live into them. My, my question for folks is like, well, well are we ready for, for what's on the other side? And, and are we preparing for that? So that's that's my big part of the why, Siddha. And I mentioned I'm seeing some, some questions come in. Yeah. And so I wanted to maybe try to pull, pull in a, a question or two um, that are coming in for folks. And so is that cool with you? We're going we're gonna to switch it up. I might catch you off guard here. You ready for that? Yeah. All right. So the first one I'm going to pull in for us is to maybe think a little bit about, um, I love this, by the way. So like Aviva, if you're out there, I'm giving you a high five. Um, the question is something about the scarcity mindset, right? So how do you really think about like maybe scarcity mindset and things like participatory engagements and collective giving? How How do you maybe counteract the tendency for folks to say like, look, we ain't got a lot to do a lot. And maybe again, people start by saying, Can, what is the smallest version of this? Or here's a reframe for you, Sita. How do we get people to bring an abundance mindset to participatory budgeting and collective giving? Um, that is a question I have wrestled with over the years. Uh, and certainly, um, one I wrestle with every day as a nonprofit fundraiser um, for myself. So, you know, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately, and this is not how I would have answered this question probably six years ago when I was in government. Um, I think we talk a lot about how do we change that mindset? How do we say, okay, um, you're coming in with the scarcity mindset, let's get you into an abundant mindset. And this happens when we're engaging communities of color around budgeting processes all the time. They, you know, I'm on the inside thinking, okay, community should ask for two to $5 million. Then I see community saying yes to $250,000. Um, we see this with climate justice, environmental justice conversations with philanthropy right now, where people are going into the room saying, hey, we want um, we want resourcing and, and saying yes to the $1 million. Meanwhile, someone else has walked into that room and been posed with $1 million and immediately said, how about we make that three, right? So there is this piece that I've been wrestling with as I've been thinking about this question, both for myself and for all these movements I'm part of. And, um, and I think actually the answer is not to change people's minds. The answer is to give people a felt and somatic experience of abundance. And so what I love about participatory budgeting and collective giving is that it gives people that experience. Put in all the money that we have, make some decisions, 
and get the experience that you can do it again and again and again, and it doesn't end, right? And so I think until people have that felt experience, you know, and I sat in this seat as a government official, right? Having to go to community and saying, no, no, trust that this will be abundant. Trust that we're going to come through. It's like community members didn't have any good reason to trust that. And it has taken time for them to see that possibility as funds have become available. And I think that's just, that's the truth of it. We aren't, I don't think we can go out there and say to people, have an abundance mindset until we've given them a, an abundance experience. Yeah. And, I, so yeah. On a t-shirt. Quick y'all. Some, somebody send that in to the t-shirt maker, because I think that that is one of the takeaways that I'm going to take with me today for, for sure. Right. We can't demand that people have an abundance mindset without some experience of of abundance i'm I'm sorry to, to jump in you just got me so excited no it was it was uh, i mean I, it's all very timely because i just i was having this conversation with the folks um that i'm when i was at climate week last week and we were just like gosh could you imagine like six years ago we would never have thought we would be sitting leading a people of color led climate justice organization that actually is abundantly resourced but the thing is that the leaders of that organization have been doing something super smart over the years, which is that even when it wasn't about money, they were naming the places and times of abundance. So people were developing an abundance mindset. It's just that money, that mindset around money came a little bit later in the game, but there was an abundance of community. There was an abundance of trust. There was an abundance of love. You know, and I say those words like they are throwaways, but I really mean them deeply. Like that is what was happening. There was an abundance of mutual aid in these in these experiences that people were having. And so I do think part of it is like people might have an abundance mindset about one aspect of of some of this work. And so how do we then expand it out beyond that? Right. And that's why I come back to that felt experience. Um because if you don't have a somatic experience of it, it's really hard to to help other, you know, to sort of broaden it and to evangelize about it. Totally. And I'll just offer maybe a big like plus one to, to that, like how important it is, even in your learning about something like collective giving or participatory budgeting to, to actually experience it, even if it is an exercise. And a thing that we often do when we go to a new place and have folks learn about PB is put everybody on the same side of the table, the, the mayoral staff and the city council, as well as community members and say, let's go through an exercise of like how this would work. Let's actually go through all of the phases of this in like real time in the next two hours while we're in the room together. Let's do a mock PB process. Let's talk about how all of these phases would work and let's open up a door to talk about how it needs to work here. So now that we've all had a quick, somatic, fast experience of this, and when I tell you that some people are like a mock PB process, this sounds like arts and crafts and it is right because people are drawing out their 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 idea actually doing their proposal and i find that maybe some of the most skeptical people in the room at the beginning get really fired up and attached to what the possibility of this thing is that they're building out in their mock exercise and when we end i often have to remind people that what we came up with in this exercise was literally an exercise nothing is on the ballot that we just described and what i find is that that experience of playing in the sandbox really does unlock something for folks and i'm going to use just this moment to touch on another question that came in in the chat and that was what would you say in an org that's interested maybe in doing something like participatory budgeting to, to management that is resistant to sharing power or giving up power needed to make budgeting decisions with the rest of their employees. And I think this is a really good question 
I think it happens in philanthropic institutions. I think it happens in 501c3 organizations or nonprofit organizations. I think this happens in, and as a reminder, government is an organization, right? It happens in the organization of government where an elected official or an individual that has control over a budget might be really resistant to going through a community process. Some of the reasons why we could really understand they have a responsibility to taxpayers, for example, they have a responsibility to the rest of the organization to make smart decisions and, and manage dollars and, and budgets well. Well, what I would say to them, though, is you also have an opportunity to, one, leave a legacy that is both leaderful and addresses issues that wouldn't normally be addressed in other organizations. When you're able to hold space and build a process together that allows people to participate in decisions, you make better decisions. So your legacy then can be a legacy of better decisions, of better decisions together. And some people are really excited about this on, on being at the, the cutting edge, right, of, of the future of work. I think that the other thing that is also true is when you start making decisions together transparently with your team. Sidi so you mentioned this already. It builds trust, right? But it also builds some of that abundance mindset. It also builds this, this space where folks can more quickly solve problems together because they're able to communicate to each other differently. And so if you want to establish a different sort of opportunity for your team, not only to trust each other, but actually to build a practice of solving problems and communicating about what's working, what's not working. This is like a way to do it. So I would almost argue that participatory budgeting strengthens teams. It allows folks to make better decisions together. And let me be honest, I'm not talking about Though I, I might be in favor of this, right? But I'm not talking about this right now. I'm not talking about walking into a place and being like, all right, y'all, the whole budget is up for grabs. <laughs> what I am talking about, though, is saying, hey, here are some of the fixed costs in our budget. Here are some of the places that we can make some decisions together. Or we have a grant opportunity that we're getting ready to apply for as a team. Can we actually have a conversation collectively about what should go in that grant and how we would use the funds if they were awarded? Those can be ways that we use tools like participatory budgeting so that everyone feels ownership over the work, excitement about the work, and so that we're able to do better work together. Those are a couple things that I might say. And we do have an, another couple of questions coming in. And said, I want to throw one more at you. Can you handle that? Sure. There's one that I will see if you, you pick the one that should I? Oh, I'm going to toss it in here. You got one in um, mind. Yeah. One of the folks in the chat is asking about how do we convince traditional funders to think of democracy not as exclusively about voter registration and voter contact, but actually about this kind of participatory approach and um, participatory activity. So it looks like this person is really talking about educating donors um, on kind of a broader understanding of democracy. So I thought, I'm sure you do this all the time um, in talking with funders. So if you can share a little bit about how you think about that question, getting people yeah. out and thinking about democracy is just an act of voter registration. Yeah, I do have this conversation a lot. And and my short answer is it depends. Um, I don't know if you all have ever heard of like a, a VPSA, but folks in the communications world use this tool that's been adapted by the Opportunity Agenda. And I, I bring this up because I, I just love it. So you all might, might love it too. Um, v stands for value, P stands for problem, solution is the S, and A is an, an action. And so oftentimes when I'm having this conversation with folks that might be traditional donors, I really think about the values that, that we share. And we've talked a lot about those values today. Equity, racial justice, healthy democracy. I think a lot about the problems that we hope to address together. And that could be something that's in a specific region that we realize is backsliding. We could be that um, as we talk about opportunities to transform democracy, 
not a lot of folks know about tools, resources, or organizations, practices that we can uplift. And then typically what I often describe is, is this real opportunity that I think traditional donors and funders have to actually support the organizations that are on the front lines of, of working with, and I, I think this is really important, of working with community members to build and strengthen models of community-led decision-making. And so I think that there are models of community-led decision-making that are well-intentioned, but are not built alongside community. And I think that those models could be great, but I think that the models that folks, especially traditional donors, have an opportunity to um, co-sign on, offer credibility to, include those models that that actually have an intentionality around working with movement-based partners and impacted community members. And, and I think those are some of like the big things for me, and that's why I'm excited about the, the work that we do at PVP and also the, the coalition building work that we do with other organizations. And so I just kind of touched a little bit on like the solution and action of this. And so you got like a bonus in your answer because you just got a quick review of like what a, what a VPSA is. But these are some of the core, the, the core things for me. It's like, again, if we want to... Um, have some sustainability in what we win in a transformed democracy. I think that we have to support those organizations that are making space for us to experience that, to have those somatic experiences. And we have to think about which organizations, places, and spaces are doing that with community and movement partners. These are going to be the most vetted tools that um, I think are going to be like transferable um, across the country and, and across across regions. I wonder, that's such a good question. I wonder if, if you just have anything that you want to add on on the end of that, Zeta. I think you, I mean, you're pulling so many really important threads. One of the things I wanted to pull forward, you had said earlier about um, this connection between participatory democracy is preparing us uh, for when we win. And I think with a lot of funders, uh, when it comes to funding in the democracy space, and, and let's be real, I think we can say this, um, the funding is disproportionately on one side of the democracy space. We need way more funding that's, that's beyond just voter registration and is actually about what we're talking about today, this kind of regular persistent democracy building. Um, and, so while we're all going to have to get out there and have those conversations to help funders see that opportunity, I think the piece that I wanna lift up is this part about like, when we win, we have to be ready. And we saw this um, and we've seen this here in local government, all the way up to federal government, that often when we win, we aren't ready to govern. And um, when we put people at a table together, they are so practiced with being advocates that it's really difficult to shed that and say, okay, now I get to govern. Now I have power. What do I do with it? And so I really think that that piece that you had shared earlier is such a key element here that a multiracial, multigendered, you know, democracy that is inclusive of people who identify across a whole range of identities doesn't exist yet. We have never experienced that in our lifetimes. Um, and I hope we will, but we can start to experience it now on a small scale in these ways that we're talking about. We can start to experience it maybe in some localities, um, and helping funders see that that's the goal of these kind of experiments and practices is it's not just navel gazing. It's not just adding process for process sake. It is literally the way we will save our democracy. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I think that to me is like, why register a bunch of people to vote if they're going to be disenfranchised? What's the point? <laughs> but if we can register people to vote and give them places where they are getting to exert and experience and build power, 
then we have a chance. Then we have a chance of really building that future that we're talking about, that multiracial future, um, and that really inclusive radical imagination democracy that we saw people commenting on in the chat. That's what we need right now, as democracy around the globe is um, under real threat. Um, and as income inequality is, you know, on such a rise that that's creating a whole host of sort of pushes towards fascism and authoritarianism, I think funders who are really concerned with democracy need to be asking themselves, where are we putting kind of small d democracy into people's daily lives? And if they aren't doing that, they're missing a huge part of the of the opportunities and what we need to do to solve on all of the major challenges of our time. That's what I would add on to that, which is really just a plus 10, 100 <laughs> to everything that you've been saying. And, well, an emphasis on us unlearning some of the things that these institutions um, and organizations teach us about how we work together. Totally. And you're you're bringing something up for me and, and Kelsey said something about this in the, the chat that stood out to me and y'all might be picking up on a thread of mine that maybe has to do with play, right? What what can we play with? How do we radically imagine? And and maybe you're also picking up on the fact that I might be a little nerdy, right? What you can't see in my blurred background is like these are all comic books back here. It's just like a lot of comic books back there. And, and I think that that's important because here's like a place that's important for, for me as an individual around my, my practice of imagination, of like bending what's possible, getting outside of maybe the, the rigid structures that I am accustomed to, and maybe just opens the door a little bit for me to think about how to encourage myself and others to step outside of, of maybe what we've known to make room for what is possible. This is how we move from the democracy that maybe we have, or to your point, have not experienced yet into the innovations in democracy that we want to normalize, right? And when I talk about play and imagination, I wanna be really clear that, that this isn't, this is fun. Okay, but it's not just fun for for fun's sake. This is a a radical act of of important rigor in building our blueprint that we're working toward together. And I think that this rigorous act of radical imagination for that democratic future or futures that we get to see ourselves in and live into is is essential. And I think it's often a missing ingredient that should drive how we talk about what's possible in spaces. It should be written in to the back of television shows. And I don't, I don't know if y'all still get commercials, but like, you know, streaming commercials, however you access your commercials, right? It should be one of those things that's like written into the background so the folks are constantly like, oh, we make decisions together. I think the biggest challenge for, for funders and those in the field to face is that people don't know. People don't know that participatory budgeting, just as one practice, started in Porto Alegre, Brazil in the 80s and spread across the world. And now there are over 7,000 instances of participatory budgeting across the globe, right? People have no idea unless they've they've interacted with one of those processes before personally, right? And so I do think that not only is this um, important act that we're describing of imagination toward practice, toward, toward being able to experience maybe some different takes on democracy, not only is that important, but I, I did just want to acknowledge that there is this piece around um, op-ed, right? That, that I think is really important for, for this movement, for this work, to answer some of the questions that are coming up into the chat. And that is really to back up and acknowledge, we did a poll at the beginning of this conversation, right? At the beginning of this conversation, we asked how, how much experience you had with collective giving just in this group. I think everyone had at least some kind of experience with, with collective giving. And I would say the vast majority of people had zero experience with there was only like two questions, right? Yes or no, right? So some folks said, no, I've, I've not done participatory budgeting before. And a small percentage of folks said, maybe 
I've, I've done it before. So even in our sample size, I would say that that's pretty standard for, for what I've, what I've seen, right? Across the country, when I'm having conversations with folks about participatory budgeting, we're talking about a thing that is 13 years new in the United States that most people still still don't know about. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I didn't want to skip over is we got to tell people about it, y'all. Right. Yeah. And I think you're naming something. There's there's both a, a way in which it's newish and people don't know about it. And also there's ways in which it's things that we've all done all, all, all along and we're bringing them back to life now, right? Like it wasn't always that people sat in government and had spreadsheets and lock boxes, as, you know, that basically you didn't know how the budget was being set. That wasn't always the case. Um, and similarly, you know, if anyone has the experience in your family of talking about budgets and figuring out where things go and what get, who gets what, depending on how your family orients around some of those conversations, you might have done some participatory budgeting. Um, so I think it's also about expanding our understanding that this is, some of this work is about us getting back to the roots of how things were done when we had community-based processes and not delegating all of that power away from ourselves, um, but, and, but really reclaiming some of that power and saying, you know what, it, these are decisions we want to make together as a community. And we saw a lot of this emerge kind of um, in the pandemic with mutual aid efforts. And I think there was much more participatory uh, sort of actions around a lot of the mutual aid money that was being raised and distributed. Um, and so, you know, part of this, I, I think there's this piece of like, we want people to know more about it. And also I want to demystify it because it doesn't have to be that complicated, right? It can yeah. be, so it's sort of like, how do we hold the duality of that? <laughs> um, don't make it so complicated that you don't start. And and that makes me think of sort of what are some of the things as folks are on this call, um, if if you can share just what would you offer for people to do in their day-to-day -day lives or in their organization? Maybe there isn't a big participatory budgeting process yet in their area. Um, what would you encourage people to think about? Yeah, Sada, I love this question. I got my eye on time. Maybe this is like one of our last questions. So maybe we're, we're yeah. starting to move toward the, the wrap here. Um, but just right before I answer this, I just wanna say one other thing real quick. And that is, um, as we think about participatory democracy, as we think about radical imagination, as we think about transforming democracy, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that, th that there are some powers and people out there that really like democracy the way that it is right now. And we've talked about all the limitations to that. And so something that I notice in the work that I do is that there certainly is backlash for folks that are on the front lines of, of, of transforming democracy, of, of making community-led decision-making more popular and for creating more opportunities for people to engage in it. And I find that, and I'll just give you an example, there's an instance of a of participatory budgeting that folks are advocating for in Cleveland, Ohio right now. And there's some really interesting coverage of this, y'all. So if you get on the Google and you check this out, you'll notice that there are some important um, bits of information from folks that are advocating for the, the Cleveland participatory process, and they're super thought out. And then there are beginning, and this is, I'm, I'm starting to see more of a trend in this direction, um, there are beginning to be some pieces about participatory budgeting that include some elements of, of misinformation. And I think that becomes challenging for, for organizers. Um, it also becomes challenging for the general public to kind of wade through like what is accurate information about this new thing that they're learning about. And so I think that that's something that we're going to have to manage in the field is also as processes like participatory democracy, participatory budgeting become more into the forefront, 
how do we have conversations about backlash, misinformation, not just demystifying, but but also building some of the expertise and skill set to say, here's the right information, here are trusted sources about this thing, um, and here are some information that is just inaccurate. I think that's going to be important for us as a movement to, to think about, and as a movement to think about who are the partners in this space that 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 allow us to tell those those stories not only so that people can access them but but maybe begin to wade through some of those bits of information okay cool that was the last thing i wanted to say about that and just bringing us into the your beautiful wrap-up question which was what are what are the things that people can start doing in their homes what are the first steps that that people might take and um my answer to this is practice. The The first step that you can take is to, is to try it out. And I get that people hear me say, try it out. And they're like, ooh, tiny step, right? I'm going to bring my toddler in here and we're going to have a conversation about what we're going to have for dinner. Now that is a collective decision. And there might be some budget involved. And so maybe there is some participatory democracy there. And that's great. I think it's a great way for you to begin to practice some of these methodologies. But I also want to acknowledge that there, you can practice big. You can practice supported. You can practice in partnership. You can practice in collaboration. You can make a choice to learn more about what participatory budgeting is or how to support that movement. You can also make a choice to, to try it out and figure out what you learn. If there's something that really stands out to me today, it's, it's how important the experience is of engaging with this that really changes people. That's also what the research on participatory budgeting says. And so I think the first thing that you can do is try it out at home, use some free resources, but don't be limited to trying it out in, in the, the building of your house. You might also try it out in, in your community and there are organizations like, like PBP and our partners that are super down to help. What about you, Sita? How, how do people start? Well, thank you. That I feel like um, this conversation has been really riveting for me and I've been able to learn so much from you about, I love this, the phrase you just said about practice big. Um, that that resonates and I think is important. Sometimes we start too small. We don't have to start small. Um, so thank you for all the wealth of knowledge and inspiration you shared. And for me, I think the answer on this, I'll wear um, the organizational hat of leading a global network um, that focuses on collective giving and and you know being partner organizations with philanthropy together to say, I think one of the best ways people can start um, aside from looking up and seeing if there's a local participatory budgeting process to get involved with is join a collective giving circle. Um, if there's a social venture partner in your back of um, your area, join that. If it's a different kind of collective giving, if you want to do political giving, there's tons of political giving circles. Philanthropy can, together can connect you with them. Um, so I, that's my first thing. That's a great way to do it. You can also start one. Uh, you can also create spaces where you're, where you get to put uh, money together and and budget um, as a group and decide where that money goes. Um, and so, yeah, I think you said it when you said practice big. I think choose a direction and and just get started because we do need it. We need people to be getting some rigor in this um, and getting some of that felt experience of what does a multiracial democracy look like? What does it look like to practice democracy when it comes to funding and capitalism and, um, and money, the movement of money? And so in all of those places, I think um, that would be my advice is just find a way in find some other people who want to collaborate with you and and get to it. And then, you well, know, reach out to others who great experts and other folks who can help you take it to even greater scale, hopefully. I love that. I love that. Get to it and and also find find people that you can think with. But but I I, I really appreciate that. Um, so that it's been so nice to be in conversation with you. All of y'all out there, it's been so nice to have y'all cheer us on in, in the chat. 
and bring some questions forward. I'm gonna uh, maybe turn it over to, to Kelsey to wrap us up. Y'all, I'm so proud of how we were able to manage our time. <laughs> I love that, y'all. Um, this was really a absolutely beautiful conversation. Um, I love it as a also former um, state employee. Um, so it just makes my heart sing because there really is so much potential, right? Both in collective giving, in our democracy spaces. And I think what's so beautiful about this, and I shared this with my team, when I shared some of the themes to some of my frequent flyers about democracy, the first response was, oh, democracy, which is just so sad, y'all, because that's like, that's what we're under, right? So hopefully this season will be a source of moving away from the ick of democracy and towards the inspiration. And so within that, I just want to name a, a few themes that really stood out to me personally. Um, I just can't echo enough the embodiment piece. Y'all who have been around this season for a while know how much embodiment means to me. It's why we focused on healing last season. Um, but for me, it's these three P's that stuck out. Power, play, and practice. And so as y'all are leaving today and you're sitting with what you learned, how are you going to learn more about power? and how power shows up in your lives, in your collective giving spaces, in your organizations? How are you gonna create space for play to dream and think about different things? Sherry, I love your example of comics. I think the comic world is such a great place to explore. For me, it's art and performance. And then finally within practice, right? How do you practice big? How do you practice bold? Do you live in a communal space? I live with my roommates, right? We could talk about budgeting more. Um, and so with that, I just wanna thank you both for coming today and sharing your experiences. This was an amazing conversation. Thank you all for sharing your questions. I dropped a survey link in the chat. Um, so please share your thoughts too, because we at Philanthropy Together, we want to help you practice. We want to help you play and we want to help you understand power. So let us know how we can continue to support you all on your journey, whether it's new themes for this season or resources or trainings or skill up building, let us know so we can help you and support you along on that journey. Um, and with that, I'm going to close out the session. Thank you all for coming. It's been a wonderful time. <laughs> Bye, everyone.